you are visiting the young Earth-like planet of Notera. Merely two and a half billion years of age, this planet's crust has just begun to stabilize into continental shelves. Notera is in its Cordean Eon, towards the beginning of which life first evolved. Now, more than a billion years have passed, and we are catching up with the living descendants of these first cells. Our area of study is a shallow enclosed sea towards the northern pole of Notera, called the Triotic Sea. The land is rocky and jagged, punctuated by sporadic volcanic activity. Weathering from enormous rainstorms seasonally brings dissolved biominerals from the surrounding basalt plateau. At the same time, rocky outcroppings of the landmass prevent the outflow of water, creating a stagnant pool rich in the ingredients of life. The atmosphere is thick, hazy, and reductive. Composed primarily of CO2, methane, and nitrogen, life on Notera has not yet produced enough oxygen to transform the atmosphere into a familiar blue. The greenhouse effect of this atmosphere is much stronger than on Earth, and even though the Noteran sun is weaker, the planet's oceans can reach up to 60 degrees Celsius. But here, in the Triotic Sea, it's calmer. Water temperatures fluctuate between 20 and 35 degrees Celsius, rendering it hospitable to a wider range of microscopic life. And its presence is already visible. Looking closely at the water reveals shimmering reflections of the sun's rays, the result of a unique and truly alien microbial community native to this sea. This is a stylized representation of what you might see under a high magnification microscope when looking into a sample of surface water. On the top right, you can see the edge of a tight-knit microbial community. A microbial community is a symbiotic or commensal collection of microbe species that live together and often rely on each other for metabolic support. Each and every community needs its foundation, and for this particular community, that is the species Photoformata triotica. This species is the primary photosynthesizer in the surface waters, or on sea floors shallow enough to be reached by light. Let's take a look at its internal structure and see what makes these microbes so special. These cells are deceptively simple. They have no cytoskeleton, no membrane-bound organelles, and no nucleus. Instead, their GNA is suspended within their interior. Very few microbes on the planet are any more complex. Large, elaborate cells like Earth's eukaryotes have yet to evolve. The volume of the microbe is dominated by a liquid called the cytoplasm, where active proteins, ribosomes, and most other biological structures can be found. In this particular cytoplasm, you can see the organelle that allows photoforms such as this one to support their unique lifestyle. The photophyll, much like Earth's chlorophyll, is a membrane-enclosed ball of pigment, which converts the sun's light into energy. To make this process even more efficient, photoforms often use a glass-like substance called silica to internally refract light, keeping it trapped within them. This organism is enclosed in a silica cell wall, responsible for its distinct clover shape. The sharp corners act as breaking points, splitting the shell in two during reproduction. Gaseous vacuoles filled with oxygen help to keep the entire microbial community afloat at the water's surface. Together with the reflective properties of the cell wall, a glimmer can be seen on the water's surface wherever Photoformata triotica is present. However, silica is not unique to Photoformata. The last universal common ancestor of all life on Noterra gave rise to two groups, taxonomically called domains. One of these groups is called Xenaria. They are perhaps more similar to Earth's bacteria. Our photosynthetic species, on the other hand, is part of a lineage known as silicozoidia. What separates these two groups is an early biochemical quirk. Hydrothermal vents, where the last common ancestor evolved, are chemically saturated with silica, silicic acid, and other silicon molecules. The ancestors of silicozoidians created metabolic pathways which integrated silicates into protein structure, stabilizing them. This, in turn, allowed them to proliferate in silica-rich areas while xenarians remained more generalist. Over time, the silicozoidian relationship with silica grew closer, and protein complexes known as colosomes evolved independently up to 20 times within the domain. Colosomes are used for the conversion of silicic acid into long polymer chains of silica, which can then be converted into solid structures, like cell walls. Returning back to our microbial community, we now turn our attention to another silicozoidian. The name of this species is Acetia symbiotica. Like Photoformata, this lineage has independently evolved colosomes, although these are membrane-bound. They use them to bind to the cell walls of photoforms, docking them in place. 
Atsetia Symbiotica, as its name suggests, is thoroughly reliant on the communities it helps to build. Its source of food is carbohydrates voluntarily exported by its photoform symbionts. In exchange, Acetia Symbiotica provides innumerable services to the microbial community. To begin with, its long, thread-like pili form a web of polymer chains which keep the entire microbial community tightly bound and stable. It also converts carbohydrates into glycogens, which are stored as granules within its cytoplasm. At night, when the photoforms are unable to produce energy, receptor sites detect the shift in chemical activity and change the cell membrane to release the glycogen back into the community thus keeping the photosynthesizers healthy and thriving. Acetia symbiotica is part of the group, Acetia, characterized by a lack of silica cell walls and an anoxic carbohydrate-dominated metabolism. Instead of breaking down carbohydrates with oxygen like we do, they break it down into lactic acid. But you don't have to look very far to find another example of an Acetian. These spiral-shaped microbes are the true guardians of the community. This is Acetia antizenaris. It's an unusual looking life form. It has no colosomes, despite being a silicozoid. But perhaps its most distinguishing feature are its multiple glyconuclei, each living in their own cytoplasmic compartment separated by infolded cell membranes called septa. Finally, you may notice that it possesses similar receptor sites to Acetia symbiotica. So what can explain this bizarre mix of features? You see, Acetia antizenaris is not just a life form, it doubles as a weapons factory. Ancestrally, antizenaris is a predator which settled into the stable hunting grounds of the photoform colony. The primary limit on its growth soon became the competition from other predator species. Keeping them out is the primary purpose of antizenaris' signature ability. It produces a complex antibiotic toxin which is capable of disrupting ribosomes in its victim's cells essentially putting protein production to a halt. Its spiral shape maximizes the surface area available to distribute as much of this toxin as it can, and its receptor sites allow it to ensure that the levels of toxin remain high in its environment. However, Acetia antizenaris is not an indiscriminate killer. The toxin begins its life inertly. It's kept in a deactivated state by a nitrogen-silicon bond called the toxin's cap. When the toxin enters the cytoplasm of an organism, the change in pH destabilizes it. Hydrolysis severs the critical silicon-nitrogen bond into an active state, in which it can wreak havoc on an organism. However, the toxin can be easily rendered inert again by simply reforming the nitrogen-silicon bond. For silicozoids, which have countless metabolic pathways dealing with silicon, this is trivial. For zanarians, it is an utterly insurmountable biochemical hurdle. This is the reason why silicozoids live in such tight communities. They are uniquely capable of creating chemical environments completely toxic to those who aren't their kin. As such, a state of perpetual biological warfare has existed for a billion years between the two domains. So, after so much time discussing the silicozoid domain, it's time to turn our attention to one of the fiercest predators of the Triotic Sea and the reason for antizenaris toxicity. This zenarian predator lives outside but in close proximity to the photoform colonies. It can't tolerate the high oxygen and toxic conditions within the colonies, so it relies on hit and run predatory tactics. This particular species is a fine representative of the lineage Zygophagus. Zygophages possess a unique dual cytoplasmic structure. Their cells are separated into an endoplasm and a periplasm. The endozoic compartment functions as a fortified core with a strong cell wall and contains almost all cellular machinery. Using transport corridors in the endozoic wall, the periplasm is tightly regulated. It serves as an intermediary compartment, where chemicals can be processed, be they food for digestion or toxins for detoxification. Zygophages navigate the world using their pili, which double as sensory implements, and locomote with a pair of flagella. But it is the hunting strategy and digestive process that makes this species particularly interesting. When its pili encounter prey, the zygophage first penetrates the cell wall and membrane of its victim. This creates a directional puncture in the cell, causing its cytoplasmic contents to spill out. Now the clock is ticking. The zygophage does not have long before its meal diffuses into the water. So, 
Its parazoic membrane begins to fold inwards, capturing cellular material which is stored in little pockets called vesicles. These vesicles will later break down, releasing their contents into the periplasm, which is filled with digestive enzymes. To vesicles which contain the prey's GNA, this happens almost immediately. But zygophagus holds onto the other contents of the prey's cytoplasm for as long as possible. You see, as I mentioned earlier, the hunting grounds of the zygophage are thoroughly inhospitable to it, but by capturing the proteins and other active components of its victims, it can also steal their immunities. For example, if its victim is an aerophile, which thrives in high oxygen environments, their cytoplasm will contain molecules that break down harmful oxygen species. This ability to steal metabolism is called kleptoplasty, and is unique to zygophagus klepti, which is where it gets its name. It allows it to hunt for much longer intervals and suffer far less damage than its contemporaries. Now that we've mapped out the major players in this community of microbes, it is also worth mentioning the other species which exist in this habitat. These purple dots represent aerophiles, which thrive on the oxygenated conditions produced by photoforms that are otherwise intolerable to most other life. Meanwhile, these larger magenta organisms are nitrogen-fixing zanarians. They have uniquely evolved a resistance to anti-Zanarian toxins, and thus are present even inside the colony, which tolerates them for the benefits they provide in making nitrogen bioavailable. But there is one species yet to be explored. These small, barely noticeable brown dots are a sleeping mass. They are endocysts, mere balls of ribosomes and GNA with no active metabolism. A hibernating life form. They can survive in this state, for over a million years. They belong to a group of Zanarian photosynthesizers who, unlike photoforms which use oxygen photosynthesis, use a different chemical process based on hydrogen sulfide. While this is typically less efficient than oxygenating photosynthesis, a seasonal cycle allows these Zanarians to compete regardless. In the winter months, the riverbeds which feed silica into the Triotic Sea dry up. A toxic buildup of oxygen begins to harm the photoform communities. All of this together, causes the photoforms to recede. Temporarily, for a few months per year, they lose their grip on the sea surface, leaving room for the endocysts to come out of their hibernation and color the water purple for the winter. These seasonal die-off events also cause the deposition of silica on the sea floor as corpses of billions of photoforms settle. Over time, generations of generations of die-off events form layered pillars in the water. These structures will remain for billions of years, much like Earth's stromatolites. But sadly, the ecosystem that made them would not last forever. Ever since the evolution of photoforms roughly 150 million years before the time of our microbial community, they have been pumping enormous quantities of oxygen into the atmosphere. For a while, iron dissolved in the oceans would take up this oxygen, turning into rust and being deposited as red layers called banded iron formations in the geologic record. Methane in the atmosphere would react with oxygen to create CO2 and water. However, by 2.3 billion years ago, both of these mechanisms had been all but exhausted. All the iron in the oceans had rusted, and most of the methane in the atmosphere had been broken down. The result was an oxygen flood, which began to fundamentally change the composition of the air and surface waters. This on its own would have been enough to destabilize ecosystems and cause mass extinction, However, a larger cascade of disaster had been set underway. Methane had served as a potent greenhouse gas, keeping the planet warm, but without it, runaway ice sheets began to spread as temperatures dropped until the entire planet was covered in one enormous sheet of ice. This was the early oxygen disaster, and it contributed to the extinction of 99% of all life on Noterra. Only a handful of small, geothermally heated communities survived this global catastrophe. In the next episode, we'll look at how life recovers from these bleak conditions, and how the next era of Noterran evolution creates large, complex cells. I will see you again in a few hundred million years.